You are welcome to this preview of the book of Acts, chapter 17, verses 16 through 34. Reading from the New Revised Standard Version Bible of 2022. Green-colored text represents variant readings from Greek manuscripts. This material is intended for those who lead men's Bible study groups. The following slides can be downloaded by the link provided below. I suggest six tasks for you who facilitate men's Bible study groups. First, begin by soliciting an opening prayer. Then, introduce the passage by providing geographical, historical, and cultural material. Then, show a working outline of the current book suggest some learning goals for this session, and then begin facilitating the discussion by first inviting someone else to read the text aloud. Then solicit comments, queries, and applications. Then share your own views and opinions without directly contradicting those of others. Pro provide some scholarly explanations if you have them. This might include word definitions and points of Greek grammar. You might summarize various interpretations commonly given to the text. Try to illustrate the teaching of the text from your own experience. Then conclude the session with three kinds of queries. What have we learned? What shall we do about it? What shall we ask God to do about it? And then solicit a closing prayer. As you enter this text, remind everyone that the events of chapter 17 occurred during Paul's second missionary journey after he had been in Thessalonica and Berea. He came to the city of Athens before continuing to Corinth. Today's verses occur at Athens in Greece. These cities had been incorporated into the Roman Empire into a province called Achaia. I suggest that you provide a simple but meaningful working outline of the entire book of Acts. Based on the words of Jesus, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. The first verses of the book contained Jesus' promise of power for witness to the nations, then a long section on the Apostles' witness in Jerusalem and Judea. Thirdly, other believers' witness in Judea and Samaria. In chapter 9, the book shifts to the Apostles' witness to Gentiles, that is, non-Jewish peoples. Chapter 15 of the book describes how the Apostles and elders at Jerusalem affirmed the conversion of Gentiles. The Apostle Paul then began preaching the gospel to the Greeks and will later preach the gospel to the Romans. In this lesson, we are still dealing with Paul's preaching the gospel to the Greeks. A few notes about the city of Athens. You could read this information and provide other background that you can find through your own study. It's a it could be helpful to describe again the backdrop of these events. Chapter 16 dealt with Paul and his partners planting churches in Galatia, then at Philippi in Macedonia. In chapter 17, they went from thence to Thessalonica, where after three weeks, because of a mob action against them, Paul had to leave town and the new believers had to post bond. The apostles then fled to Berea, from whence the brethren sent Paul by boat to Athens. After Silas and Timothy rejoined Paul at Athens, he sent Timothy back to Thessalonica and Silas elsewhere. Whilst waiting for their return, Paul was viewing the sights in Athens as tourists do to this day. What shall we learn from this lesson? Here are some possible learning goals. What can folk know about the true God 
apart from the gospel? When is it legitimate for us to quote from non-Christians to introduce the gospel? What else do pagans need to learn about the true God in order to gain eternal life? And then, how does today's gospel differ from the Apostles' gospel? Have someone read aloud verses 16 and 17. Explain that the term distressed in Greek is a rather vague term that covers a range of emotions. The term argued, dialegomai in Greek, gives us the English term dialogue, meaning to discuss or debate. Then pose this query. How could we be trained to discuss and debate? Have someone read aloud verse 18. Explain Epicureanism using this definition or others that you might find. Explain that the term divinity, daimonion, in Greek referred to transcendent incorporeal beings with status between humans and deities. This is how they understood Paul's reference to Jesus. Then explain Stoicism, reading this definition or others that you might find. Have someone read aloud verses 19 through 21. Explain that the verb here, took, is often translated seized. Apparently they insisted that Paul follow them to the Areopagus. The Areopagus is really two words in Greek, meaning Eris Hill. Aris being the Greek name of the Roman god Mars, hence the translation Mars Hill, also referring to local authorities adjudicating public order issues. Some have pointed out that this passage is similar to Plato's account of the death of Socrates. Socrates had begun in the Agora, or the marketplace, debating with philosophers who charged him with introducing new gods, which was illegal, and he was brought before the Areopagus Council. At the present point in history, however, Paul, a Roman citizen, was not in immediate danger of being sentenced to death. Have someone read aloud verses 22 and 23. The term translated spiritual can mean devout or religious. And then the unknown God. Athenians were known by others often to swear in the name of the unknown God. You might provide a translation of the inscription on this ancient altar found in Athens. The Areopagus is still there in Athens, though it no longer has buildings or meetings. Have someone read aloud this account from Diogenes, on lives of eminent philosophers explaining the history of the unknown God. Explain a few things about Epimenides, that he was a philosopher who lived between the 7th and 6th centuries before Christ. Some of his writings have been preserved to this day and are quoted twice in the New Testament, especially these four lines. Quote, They fashioned a tomb for you, holy and high one. Cretans, always liars, evil beasts, idle bellies. But you are not dead. You live and abide forever. For in you we live and move and have our being. End of quote. The lie of the Cretans was that the god Zeus was mortal whereas Epimenides considered Zeus to be immortal. Hence the phrase, Cretans, always liars, which also appears in the Hymn to Zeus of Callimachus. Have someone read aloud verses 24 and 25, and compare the text of Isaiah 42, 5. Have someone read aloud verses 26 and 27. Note that in Acts 17, 24 through 30, Paul may have been quoting from several other Greek literary sources, of which we have no surviving manuscripts. 
We surmise this because of his unusual way of expressing truth. Verse, have someone read aloud verses 28 and 29. Here's another quotation. Let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of God. Even the sea and the harbor are full of this deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to God, for we are indeed his offspring. Written by Arastus Soli in the 3rd or 2nd century B.C. From this chapter, have your participants discuss together what the Greeks knew about the true and living God. For examples, he may be unknown, may be worshipped. It is he who made the world and everything in it, Lord of heaven and earth, etc., etc., etc. Then have someone read aloud verses 30 and 31. Pose this query. What does it mean that God overlooked? Have someone read Romans 3.25 and explain that God left sins unpunished for centuries whilst waiting for Jesus to come and suffer on a cross. Have someone read aloud Jesus' commandment from Luke 24, 47 explained that the verb to repent had three distinct usages in Greek. It could mean to change one's mind or to feel remorse or, in a Christian sense, to be converted to Jesus Christ. From these same verses, discover more about the nature of God known only through biblical or Christian revelation. The true God is not like an image formed by mortals. In times past, he overlooked human ignorance, but now commands all people everywhere to repent, for he has fixed a day to have the world judged in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed, giving assurance to everyone by raising this man from the dead. Have someone read aloud verses 32 through 34. Pose this query. What part of the Christian gospel do non-believers find most incredible, that is, hard to believe? This must include the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then ask, what do we say in defense of that belief? Let the Christians explain why they believe Jesus is risen from the dead. Then note several reasons to believe in our own coming resurrection. Many other Bible prophecies have come true. Even the Messianic servant was to suffer and live again, and the crucified Messiah must yet reign over us believers forever. In fact, Jesus resuscitated several dead folk and then foretold his own death and resurrection, which eyewitnesses have reported and recorded in the New Testament. We also know that he has given us the Holy Spirit, who has changed our own life supernaturally. And, of course, to live again remains a near-universal human wish. We know that folk have returned from clinical death to report their experiences, most importantly of all, Jesus has promised that he will raise us back to life upon his return to earth. Christians have explained what they call the gospel in many different ways. Currently, in Western countries, amongst evangelical Christians, the gospel message often begins with the truth that God loves you, but... God is holy and must punish sin. And, of course, we have all sinned, and our sin deserves death. But God sent Jesus to die for us, or in our place. So, if we believe in Jesus, God will save us from death. To make this happen, say this prayer. 
and they provide a prayer. To those who say the prayer, we might say, you are now saved, so go start telling others. Now, how does this compare with the original gospel as the apostles preached it in the New Testament? They would often cite the fact that God does good to everybody and that God reveals himself to those who seek him. However, he will one day judge everyone righteously. Meanwhile, God worked miracles through Jesus, but men crucified Jesus to death. But then God raised Jesus from death back to life. And so all who repent and believe in the Lord Jesus and are baptized will be forgiven everything. They will receive the Holy Spirit and should show their repentance by obeying Jesus' commandments. To conclude your session, pose this query. What did we learn from this passage today? Let any or everyone reply. Then ask, what shall we do about it? Accept every reply. And what should we ask God to do? Then have someone ask God to do it. Introduce the next study, which will be from Acts chapter 18, events that happened while Paul was in the Greek city of Corinth. There, we'll seek to learn what to do when your community resists the gospel. Secondly, what to do when enemies bring false charges against us. Then, what is the optimal gospel team size? And fourthly, what is sufficient time for a mission team to stay in a place before they move on?